Welcome. I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. HBO's mega hit show Succession has followed siblings seeking the crown to their CEO father's empire over four seasons. And no one has really wanted the top job more than Kendall Roy, played to devious, desperate perfection by actor Jeremy Strong. But before booking that role, Strong was just another working actor. After earning a scholarship to Yale, Strong moved to New York, where he started auditioning, barely scraping by. I don't think I had anything in my fridge. You know, I worked a lot of jobs, waiting tables, jobs? room service, shredding paper, you know, every, 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 anything. Most of his acting work came on the stage, off Broadway. There's inherent value in just doing good work, the feeling of... You know, no one might see you do this play. You're making 50 bucks a week, but you're swinging for the fences. Then came that play here at the Rattlestick. There was a casting director. She came to see me in this play, and that year I worked on Lincoln and Zero Dark Thirty and Parkland after that, and it just, everything changed. Later in the show, Jeremy Strong on if he'd continue playing Kendall Roy if there were a fifth season. If HBO was like, you know what, sorry, one more short season. The truth is, and I think Jesse felt the same way, for my character at least, that arc has come to, to a completion. In, 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 in a supremely, almost historical, you know, I feel a sense of having been given, it's like getting to play Michael Corleone or something. You know, it's like getting to play one of the great, writing-wise, one of the great modern antiheroes. Kendall is just a, a tragic hero, a, a kind of disaster in slow motion unfolding over four seasons, over 39 hours of story. Then Serena Altschul, with the history of a once humble work pant turned style icon, Levi's legendary 501 blue jeans. What's the difference between the 501 and some of the other models and jeans that you could try on and buy at Levi's? Well, it's always a straight blue jean. I mean, when we look at other fits, we've got like skinnies, flares, bell bottoms, you know, all bells and whistles, but the 501 always just remains very simple and classic. So it's not going to follow the trends, period. No, it's something you can rely on. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Jeremy Strong went from performing in sparse off-Broadway theaters to winning an Emmy for his role in HBO's Succession. As the series comes to a close, Strong reflected on challenges faced and memories made with our Ben Mankiewicz. I mean, everything has changed and nothing has changed. Yeah. Nestled between a New York City church and a small Mediterranean restaurant, the Rattlestick Theater conjures up powerful memories for Jeremy Strong. These weren't here. They took these risers down. Back in 2011, Strong was a struggling actor, appearing as an Afghanistan war veteran in Paraffin, an off-Broadway play. This was like a 60-seat theater where the bathroom is on the stage. It is on the stage, yeah. And you could smell the falafel stand downstairs, but it didn't matter. More than a decade later, Strong is a success story thanks to his role on HBO's really hit series, time. Succession. The show is fictional, but at times seems inspired by some real life media dynasties. My father is a malignant presence, a bully and a liar. And he was fully personally aware of these events for many years. Strong's character is Kendall Roy, troubled and talented scion of his family's media empire one of four siblings desperately seeking their father's approval. I mean, they're not the 1%, they're the 0.001%. Yeah. But yet, there are working class families, people all over the spectrum who clearly relate. I find that very moving because I think at the heart of it, it's a story about family and the need for love and the need for validation. So it's incredibly universal. Now I'm afraid I have to inform you, you are all dismissed. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're all fired. His character may have grown up with a silver spoon in his mouth and a sense of entitlement in his soul, but Jeremy Strong is not Kendall Roy. 
Born Christmas Day, 1978, Strong spent the first decade of his life in Jamaica Plain, a working class neighborhood in Boston. There's a crosswalk somewhere. I think it's up there. Jeremy's father, David Strong, was everything Logan Roy isn't. Caring, paternal, and heroic. Once nearly sacrificing his own life as he walked with his son, then eight, to a neighborhood park, the Arnold Arboretum. There was a car coming like 40 miles an hour that wasn't slowing down for the traffic light. So he picked me up and he threw me out of the way. Oh, really? And he got hit by the car, broke all the bones in both of his legs. Your dad? Saved my life, yeah. There's things you're able to do that I can't, maybe. Maybe. The intensity and resentment that we see from Kendall is not a product of Jeremy's childhood. None of that comes from your relationship with your dad. No, and I don't think I understand how I have access to that relationship. There's not some hidden trauma in my life or my background. In you fact, know, he took us with him like, to visit know, his childhood home. And that's my house. Um, the moments seemed to catch him off guard. You haven't seen it in 20 years. It just feels big feelings coming back here. I don't want to monumentalize it, but in a way, these are like the waters of childhood. At around five, Strong started acting in community theater. In high school, he got jobs on local movie sets, learning from filmmakers he grew up idolizing. I worked on The Crucible. I worked on Amistad. I remember Tony Hopkins, you know, giving his speech. What are we to do with that embarrassing, annoying document? As John Quincy Adams and you know, it was incredible. It was incredible. He even got to work with Daniel Day-Lewis, an uncommonly committed actor who's had a lasting influence on Strong. I'm a student, you know, I'm, I think eternally, really. And you're trying to absorb visceral clues from anywhere you can. After earning a scholarship to Yale, Strong moved to New York, where he started auditioning, barely scraping by. I don't think I had anything in my fridge, you know. I worked a lot of jobs, waiting kind tables, of jobs? room service, shredding paper, you know, every, 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 anything. Most of his acting work came on the stage, off Broadway. There's inherent value in just doing good work. The feeling of, you know, no one might see you do this play. You're making 50 bucks a week, but you're swinging for the fences. Then came that play here at the Rattlestick. There was a casting director. She came to see me in this play, and that year I worked on Lincoln and Zero Dark Thirty and Parkland after that, and it just, everything changed. So you're offering us a chance to short this pile of blocks. More movie work followed before that big break in 2016, being cast as Kendall Roy, which has earned him an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor. Action that, but soft, no prints. The critical praise is due in part to his hyper-focused approach to finding his character's emotional reserves. I killed a kid. On succession, he often isolated himself from the rest of the cast, which is exactly what Kendall would do. So you're not a method actor, right? You wouldn't no. say you would say no to that. Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, it's it's everybody has a method, but I would say mine is always changing, and it's really just following the line of your intuition, that is dictated by whatever you're working on. Is there a risk in that level of commitment to you personally? The fear I would have is that, you know, it'll, you'll burn out. I don't think so, because I find a tremendous amount of joy in, in doing this. A bit of that joy, however, has been tempered. There's been criticism fueled by a 2021 headline-making profile in The New Yorker that Strong's process can go too far. Did it make you sad? Sure. Yeah. He'd prefer not to discuss the article, but to his credit, he answered every question we asked. It made me feel foolish to be presented in a certain light. Do I regret it? Would I do, here's the thing, would I do anything differently? Would I, would I hedge or hold, or, or hold back answers or try and calibrate myself differently? No. Strong has found time recently for other projects, 
A married father of three can afford to be picky now. Next year, he'll return to a familiar place, the stage, in An Enemy of the People on Broadway. I read it and I just immediately said yes. But it's his work on succession that has defined Jeremy Strong for the past seven years. And now it's time to let go of Kendall Roy. But you're done now. Yeah. Put Kendall to rest. Yeah, I did. I went home to Denmark where my wife and I have a place and I went out, sat on the beach, watched Kendall go down with the sunset. Adios. You felt that was okay? I've been living with this character and carrying or trying to carry his struggle for so long, but I'm happy to be finished and, and relieved and released. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from our chat with Jeremy Strong. Something you only see right here on the CBS News Street. To stay with us. You know, that alone is, is a huge achievement for any actor. As promised, here's more from Jeremy Strong and Ben Mankiewicz. Before you had kids, what would you and Emma do on a date? What would you do? Would you go to a Knicks game? No. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something that I could say. What would we do on a date? No, just normal, normal stuff, you know? She loves rom-coms, so we watch rom-coms. I'm like a normal person that give me does... A, give me a romantic that does, comedy that you like. Take your time. I We're not going to... I plead the fifth. Ben, I plead the fifth. Notting Hill? Notting I love Hill's, Notting Hill. Notting Hill's great. Notting right? Hill's a great movie. It's great. Yeah. Notting Hill is a great, great movie. Yeah, it is a great movie. Uh, if, if HBO was like, you know what? Sorry. One more short season. The truth is, and I think Jesse felt the same way, for my character at least, that arc has come to to a completion in, in, in a supremely, almost historical, you know, I feel a sense of having been given, it's like getting to play Michael Corleone or something, you know, it's like getting to play one of the great, writing-wise, one of the great modern anti-heroes. Kendall is just a, a tragic hero, a, a kind of disaster in slow motion unfolding over four seasons, over 39 hours of story. And so it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate gift as an actor. You know, I think some of the more exciting things you, you can look for as an actor are those road to Damascus moments where there's profound changes, profound internal changes of state, changes of character, changes, reversals. And the number of those moments across those seasons, it's, it's really staggering as an achievement of the writers and if, if you had told me when I was doing this play here that I would get to do that, it's like, you know, the, the pinnacle of what you could hope for as an actor. Nothing more important. There's no bigger compliment than saying you were headed to a career as a successful character. Actor, Thank you. Right? No, I mean, listen, the highest, you know, the highest aspiration that any actor has is, is to be working. You know, that alone is, is a huge achievement for any actor. And working on, you know, there was a few years where I was getting to do films like Lincoln and Selma and Aaron's films. You know, the Trial of Chicago 7 was, I mean, I guess that happened after Succession, but that alone was a real milestone for me, getting to play Jerry Rubin and getting to be part of telling that story. You know, every actor wants to be recognized by their peers and get these chances, but the ideal creatively is to disappear. You know, that's why you kind of become an actor in the first place, I think, is, or why I did. It's an escape. It's a, it's a release from some pressure valve. And, like, I don't see Kazal. I, you know, I see the character. And that's, that's, you know, if I have some ideal, it's that. And that's what I wish to do, sort of going forward. It's what I've always wanted to do. It's why getting to do Armageddon Time and Charles Chicago 7 was so important to me as a counterballast, you know, while I was working on Succession, getting to do these, these roles that were, just couldn't be more different. You talked about it as a pressure valve wanting to disappear and escape. What, 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 what were you trying to es escape from? You Nothing think? extraordinary, you know, just, I think, childhood and uh, probably, you know, I was a very sensitive kid and absorbed, I think, a lot of the distress and heaviness at home and why was home heavy 
just precarity, you know, financial struggle and, um, a, you know, a struggling marriage and, and discord. Your uh, parents' marriage was, was hard? Yeah, my parents' marriage was... was Are uh, they still married? Or? They're not. They separated a lot on and off, you know, and then divorced eventually, and I'm very close with both of them. And um, But I think you absorb, you know, whatever those sort of clouds, gloom clouds are in a home, you internalize yeah. and absorb them as a child. And And also, I think it's a social thing, you know? I think, like, I've talked about this before, but I feel that this is true. It's like, even when I was sitting down to do this, I'm aware that I feel so much more anxiety sitting and talking to you for an interview than I felt when I was on this stage in front of an audience, you know, to perform for Where you could three humiliate hours. yourself, right? Where you, where you every night, yeah. And I actually had to do some things in that play where I had to humiliate myself every night. Um, but I think it's because you're coming from just a different place in yourself. One is a social, your social self, and one is your creative self. And so a lot of the work of, of the actor, for me, is to sort of dis, disrobe your social self and, and, and peel all that away and, all, and, and come from that other column and that sort of purer place. And as a kid, uh, I felt a sense of freedom that I just didn't feel socially when I was doing plays. It was like this just sort of abracadabra. I think when you get older, it becomes something very different. It becomes something, you know, the great Phil Hoffman talked about acting as something incredibly private that you do for the world. And I think that is what I found it to be. Up next, a dynasty of denim. Welcome back. Levi's jeans got their name from founder Levi Strauss way back in 1853. Over the years, they produced many popular garments, but none more iconic than the original Levi's 501 blue jeans. Serena Altschul visits the Levi's factory to celebrate 150 years of the perfect pant. So all kinds of experiments are happening There's, here. Yeah. At the Eureka Innovation Lab in San Francisco, Testing is underway, but you won't find a white coat in this laboratory. So this is where the magic happens with the laser? Oh, wow. Here, you're more likely to find a pair of jeans. Oh my god, it's on fire. I mean, Levi's, to me, is kind of the birth of cool. Protecting that cool is the mission of Levi's design director, Paul O'Neill. There's so much work in progress. He considers himself a custodian of the company's many legendary styles. But this is how it all began. Including one superior fit. I mean, we tried to not to touch the 501 so much. Like from its beginnings in 1873 up until the late 1940s, all of the changes that happened were practical. This year, that iconic pair is celebrating 150 years. What's the difference between the 501 and some of the other models and jeans that you could try on and buy at Levi's? Well, it's always a straight blue jean. I mean, when we look at other fits, we've got like skinnies, flares, bell bottoms, you know, all bells and whistles, but the 501 always just remains. Very simple and classic. So it's not going to follow the trends, period. No, it's something you can rely on. Finding a reliable and durable pair of pants was the goal of businessman Levi Strauss and his tailor, Jacob Davis. This is an 1873 or 1874 model year. Levi's historian Tracy Panic says those trusty pants weren't possible until Davis added a rivet, creating the modern day blue jean. He came up with the idea of adding a little bit of metal in the pockets where your hands are going in and out and to stop them from ripping, you add a little bit of that metal and it stopped that. But why the number 501? It's a simply a lot number. A simple way to keep records. 501 is the best top of the line. Top of the line, 
but the 501 was made for everyday blue collar workers. At the time, they were called overalls because you'd pull them up over your clothes to have this protective outer garment. Nowadays, just about everyone has worn a pair of Levi's, from presidents to hippies to Hollywood. Isn't that cute? <laughs> hey, Johnny, what are you rebelling against? What do you got? They were even part of Steve Jobs' uniform. But we've got something unusual on his. Check out all the buttons. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So he did that himself. He put in suspender buttons. Like, that's did. hilarious. Yeah. As for the most efficient way to break in a new pair of 501s, Paul O'Neill has the secret. You can sit in the bathtub in them. If you buy a pair of jeans that are the right size for you, but maybe a bit too long in the leg to allow the shrinkage, and if you sit in the tub, the jeans will mold to your body shape. So you'll truly get a unique pair of 501s. Tricks of the trade, I love it. Yeah. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right back here next time on Here Comes the Sun.